Hello, in this video, we're going to talk about and learn about midbrain syndromes. This is a second part uh, video to the midbrain anatomy video. In order to talk about midbrain syndromes, we first need to revise uh, the rules of four for the brainstem, which is a simplified method that is used to understand brainstem anatomy and brainstem vascular syndromes. So the rules of four, as the name suggests, there are four rules. And within each of these rules, it is all related to four, basically. So the first rule of the rules of four is that there are four structures in the midline of the brainstem beginning with M. And these are the motor pathways or the cortical spinal tract, which passes the midline, the medial lemniscus, the medial longitudinal fasciculus and the pathway, as well as the motor nuclei and cranial nerves, which are also located the nuclei in the midline. The second rule of the rule of fours is that there are four structures to the side or lateral, beginning with S, so S for sides. And these structures are the spinocerebellar pathway, the spinothalamic pathway, the sensory nuclei of the fifth cranial nerve are located laterally, as well as the sympathetic pathway. The third rule of the rule of fours is that there are four cranial nerves in the medulla, which is the bottom part of the brainstem. There are four cranial nerves in the pons and four cranial nerves above the pons, two in the midbrain and two above. So again, above the pons, there are cranial nerves one, two, three, and four. Cranial nerves three and cranial nerves four are within the midbrain. In the pons, there are cranial nerves 5, 6, 7, and 8. And in the medulla, there are cranial nerves 9, 10, 11, 12. The last rule, the fourth rule of the uh, rule of fours, is that the four cranial nerve nuclei that are in the midline can be easily remembered by being divisible or that can divide equally into 12 except one and two. So the four cranial nerves I'm talking about that are in the midline and divide equally into 12 include cranial nerves three, cranial nerves four, six, and 12. Cranial nerves five, seven, nine, and 11 are in the lateral aspects of the brainstem. What makes this even more interesting is that the cranial nerves at the midline so 3, 4, 6, and 12 are all motor nerves. So now that we have revised the rule of fours of the brainstem, we can now use what we have learned to look at the midbrain syndromes. And we're going to look at four midbrain syndromes in particular. So in the first syndrome, let's talk about a case. The case is of a woman that presents with sudden right-sided diplopia and ptosis with a down and out eye on that right side. She also complains of left-sided weakness of her upper limb and lower limbs. These signs and symptoms are caused by occlusion of a branch of the posterior cerebral artery causing what is called Weber's syndrome or ventromedial midbrain syndrome. In this case, the lesion is on the right side. And what this results in is ipsilateral oculomotor nerve palsy. So right-sided in this scenario, causing diplopia, ptosis, and the eye going down and out. It also causes right pyramidal motor tract lesion involvement in the midbrain. And so this will result in contralateral hemiparesis because remember, 
the motor fibers actually decussate in the medulla. The second syndrome, again a case, of a man that presents with right-sided diplopia and ptosis and a down and out eye, but this time the man actually presents also with left-sided sensory changes, specifically vibration and proprioception loss. He also has left-sided hemiparesis and associated ataxia. This presentation is caused by a condition called Benedict syndrome. Benedict syndrome occurs due to a lesion in the tegmentum of the midbrain, as well as the cerebellum. The lesion can be due to infarction, hemorrhage, tumor, or infiltrative conditions such as tuberculosis. It can result from occlusion of the posterior cerebral artery or its penetrating branches, as well as the branches of the basilar artery. In this case, the lesion is on the right side again. Current textbooks vary considerably in the definition of the structures involved with this lesion. What you get, again, with this right sided a Benedict syndrome is ipsilateral, so right-sided ocular motor nerve palsy, causing diplopia, ptosis, and the down and out eye. The right lemniscal tract in the midbrain will cause contralateral sensory changes to vibration and proprioception. The red nucleus involvement will cause contralateral ataxia, specifically the motor pathway. The right pyramidal motor tract involvement in the midbrain will cause contralateral hemiparesis. What I have not drawn here is that the superior cerebellar peduncle can also be affected, and this will cause ipsilateral sensory ataxia. The third midbrain syndrome, without looking into a case, is called Claude syndrome. And it's used to describe ocular nerve palsy on the same side of the lesion with contralateral ataxia. This is caused by lesions involving the third nerve fascicle itself. Contralateral ataxia is due to involvement of the red nucleus, which is motor. But again, in the same area, one can get ipsilateral ataxia. So on the same side due to involvement of the superior cerebellar peduncle. This might get a bit confusing, but I hope that made sense. The fourth and final midbrain syndrome, again, we will look at a case. Here you have a 75 year old man who presents with impaired upward gaze, nystagmus and bilateral lid retraction. When you examine the old man, you notice that his pupils do not react to light. So there is impairment of light reaction. However, accommodation response is intact. This, this last part specifically, where one does not respond to the light reflex but can accommodate and pupils constrict, is known as argyle robertson pupil. And all these signs and symptoms are due to a condition that can collectively be called paranoid syndrome, also known as the dorsal midbrain syndrome. This condition results from injury to the mesencephalic tectum, the back of the midbrain. Causes of paranoid syndrome are brain tumors in the pineal or midbrain, demyelination within the area or stroke of the upper brainstem. Another manifestation of paranoid syndrome is convergence retraction nystagmus. And in order to understand this, you have to appreciate the diagram, which shows you that you have these supranuclear centers, which have nerve fibers that inhibit the cranial nerve 3 nucleus. So damage of the midbrain supranuclear fibers, which normally inhibit 
the third nerve nucleus, essentially preventing activation of the extraocular muscles innervated by cranial nerve 3, will be disrupted. And therefore, these extraocular muscles, the medial, superior, and inferior rectus muscles will have constant stimulation. The eyes will retract thanks to the superior and inferior rectus contraction, and the eye would look medially due to medial rectus contraction. And again, this is all because your cranial nerve 3 is active and there's no inhibition to that cranial nerve 3 nucleus. Another manifestation is bilateral lid retraction. And this is due to loss, again, of the supranuclear input to the third nerve nucleus. Without inhibitory effects of the supranuclear fibers at the posterior commissure, the levator palpebra superioris receives constant stimulation via the ocular motor nerve, and so you get lid retraction. Finally, um, what you see in paranoid syndrome is argyl robertson pupil, also known as light near dissociation, where one can accommodate, but one does not respond to light. The pupils do not constrict to light. And this, again, is due to injury or lesion to that posterior aspect or the back of the midbrain. So in summary, in this video in particular, we talked about the rules of four and midbrain syndromes, specifically Weber's syndrome, Benedict syndrome, Claude syndrome, and lastly, paranoid syndrome. Thank you for watching.